So happy to be here with D. Ayla Cal. Ayla, how are you? Thank you so much for coming on. I'm so great. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much uh, again for coming on. I'm a big fan of yours. I was reading your blog post earlier on AylaKel.com. A uh, good commercial on my part. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Of course, specifically loss. Uh, you are so authentic uh, and transparent in those blog posts. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you for posting those. Yeah, thank you for reading them. You know, it's it's always so interesting when you make moves to putting yourself on display like that and putting yourself out there. And for a long time, I think selfishly, I didn't want to share necessarily so much. And then as soon as I did start opening up about my life experiences and about you know, what I was going through, it was amazing to me how many people were happy to share back. And I think that that's been the cooler aspect of it for me is getting to start conversations with people who maybe haven't had anybody to talk to lately. Yeah. With the pandemic and everything going on, just me being the first person to say, hey, what's going on with you? What does loss mean to you? Has been really cool to see my phone kind of blow up and like people want to talk. And I love that. I see that there's so many positive responses. So it just shows the difference that you're making. My favorite line was, boy, am I a puzzle. Uh, and I just want to tell you, that that's okay. At the end of the day, we're all puzzles. Uh, and at the end of the day, if we were all perfect puzzles, all, if all the pieces fit, life would be boring. Life would be too yeah. easy. You know, we're, we're supposed to, to live life in order to try to fit those puzzle pieces together. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, especially during this time, people have been forced to spend a little more time with themselves. We usually are able to have a million distractions of let's go do this, let's go get lunch, let's go do all this stuff. But right now it's, hey, sit with yourself and deal with you for a little bit. And that's, that's hard for a lot of people. And I think that um, my favorite thing that's come out of the pandemic so far has been people prioritizing mental health and self-care so much, which is so great because it used to just be well, how productive are you? Like, how busy are you? And now we get to actually like look at who we are and have some time to reflect. And I think that's been a, a huge plus in a very huge negative. Yeah, yeah. I, I am a social work major. And so self-care is something that I've learned to prioritize for myself really well. But there's kind of like a stigma, uh, not just with mental health in its entirety, but with like taking care of yourself. Like, yeah, I feel like there's always been that, that stigma, like, you, you know, you should care about others or it's kind of selfish. Yeah. But in order, and I hear this all the time, and it's so true, in order to take care of others around you, you have to first take care of yourself. Yeah. You, you put the oxygen mask on yourself and then on others. Yeah. It is so true. 100%. On to different things. You were in a Pringles commercial uh, when you were younger, weren't you? Yes, I was. I tap danced and played the accordion in a Pringles commercial. Do you have any connections there still? Um, not really, but I can still play the accordion and I'm still a proficient tap dancer. That is awesome. I was going to tell you because my birthday is in June, so we're pretty close, sort of, not really. Uh, and I love Pringles. So if you could hook, you know, a, a friend up with Pringles for life, I think that'd be the greatest gift I could ever ask for. <laughs> I'll get right on that. I will make some calls immediately. <laughs> Thank you. Now, what exactly is the accordion? Is, is it that thing? Is that the accordion? It's this one. What? Oh, oh the, 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 that like that? Yeah. That's yeah. a good workout, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. And I was a very small child and had a very adult size accordion. So <laughs> it looked hilarious. I actually learned how to play it initially for a movie I did where I played young Barbara Mandrell. And I, it was ridiculous. They thought that like, oh, we'll just loop it in. And I was like, I'll learn it as a small child. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of like Tom Cruise <laughs> doing his own stunts like in Mission Impossible and stuff like that. Like that, that dude's jumping buildings. You couldn't pay me <laughs> enough money for that. Like, especially the instruments. Like I have the, the, the acoustic guitar over there and I've had it for about three months. Uh, you know, I, I started, you know, during the, uh, you know, quarantine and, and during these COVID times. And I yeah. gave it up about a week into it because my fingers started getting like these weird calluses. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, hell no. It's a really real thing. And actually, uh, me and my boyfriend are about to be releasing a song here soon. And it was, of course, he was like, hey, you have a banjo. You can totally play that, right? And I was like, ugh. <laughs> a banjo is not my strongest instrument. Now, in, in this song, are you going to be playing the accordion? 
I'm not playing the accordion in this one. We toned it down a little bit, but I, I'm trying to find any reason I can play an accordion because, I mean, I think I need to own one again. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> if you ever need like a, a backup guitarist who sucks, let me know because I, I can make some really, really, really weird noises with the guitar. <laughs> Most people who are experienced don't even know, how, they have no idea how to do that. <laughs> they wouldn't be capable of no. such sounds. That's right. And I broke my pinky when I was younger. And so now I can hit some of those chords that most people can't do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That'd be yeah. a huge get. <laughs> Sorry if you can hear my dog. She's having a tough time today. She's just, yeah, there she is. Sorry. <laughs> what type Sorry. of dog? Um, I, we rescued a cattle dog border collie is what the rescue said, but she just looks like a like German shepherd kind of thing. She's five months now, but she has just been having a tough time this week. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> she's been silent this entire time. And now that I have like a bunch of stuff to do, she's like, Hey, I'm going to be really loud and annoying. It is my goal to have 12 teacup puppies. Have you ever seen like those mini little teacup puppies? Oh yeah, they're so precious. Yes. I've decided that for my, uh, you know, whenever I move out of the uh, parents' home here, I'm going to get a fanny pack. I'm going to get two teacup puppies that stick their little heads out. And it gives me an excuse to go walk around the neighborhood and show off my little puppies, right? <laughs> you should absolutely do that. Yes, I should. I'm going to do it. And maybe on the podcast, I'm going to have the two... You know what? We were talking before the interview about the blank wall. I'm going to create yes. a little spot for the teacup puppies just to sit right there and there. Yes. They need their own little like pedestal stage back there. That's a brilliant idea. Yeah. And then you can be, you know, backstage, but also puppies. Oh my God. This is absolutely brilliant. Anyway, so at four years old, you played Trouble in Los Angeles Opera's Madama Butterfly. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah, I loved it. It was one of the coolest experiences for me and it definitely solidified me wanting to be an artist for sure. Um, because being so young and getting to see people who were so talented, like singing opera right in your ear is the coolest thing ever. And I actually lost my first tooth during dress rehearsal of, yeah, of Madame Butterfly. It was pretty wiggly and I had a long time of just like sitting on the stage pretending to be asleep. And so the entire time I was just during dress rehearsal sitting there like I was going to get it out. And then right at we were practicing our first curtain call and I just went like a four year old does. Yeah, and Pusito Domingo was very excited for me and sent me flowers and was my first tooth fairy. So I had pretty high expectations that my parents regretted. but. That's yeah. an experience you won't ever forget. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I think I was the only kid who was like up and performing at 11 p.m. though, because opera, you know, life is short, but opera is long is what they say. And oh my goodness, I mean, I would be up all night and then have to go to school in the morning. <laughs> oh my God, I can't even imagine. Yeah, it's amazing that I made it through elementary school. Yeah, it absolutely, it absolutely is. I remember at four years old, I, I don't know why I remember this, but I was doing like the little preschool choir. I remember uh, I was the one kid who was always off pitch and I knew it about myself, but I kind of, you know, work it because, you know, if you have the skill to, to work it, you should just do it. I'm pretty sure my parents were in like the audience and the other parent next to me would be like, who's your kid? And they would point to everyone besides me. I was that one off pitch. Horribly out of tune singer for sure. Not that one. <laughs> like whoever it is, it's definitely not him right there. Yeah. <laughs> were, were you nervous at four years old to be performing or did it kind of just come natural to you? You know, I wasn't really nervous. And I think that when you do it from such a young age, you're just used to it. It just is. It's not like you have the awareness of, okay, now I'm getting on stage in front of, you know, thousands of people. It just, I don't know. This is what we do on Tuesday nights. Maybe, maybe if I had an accordion on stage while I was singing, I'd feel more comfortable. Like maybe. See, that was the key. The accordion started it all. <laughs> only, only if we had met before and you had told me that I need an accordion, it would have worked. You need an accordion. This is, this is how it rolls. <laughs> so you did ballet for years and years. Did that help? And I'm sure it, it helped in regard to, to theater with your overall stage presence. But how did it kind of help with an acting and vice versa? Um, I think that it helped on a few different levels. I think that it gave me a really good work ethic for how I approached my process in acting and, um, you know, 
it's hard to be an actor. There's a lot of rejection, especially in the beginning when you don't have a fan base or an audience or anything like that. It, there's a lot of rejection and nothing trains you more for rejection than ballet. It is the most rejection. There was a, I had a teacher, Connie Mathot. Hi Connie, I love you. Um, but she had a saying of good, better, best, never let it rest till your good is better and your better best. Huh. Wow. That's a tough one to have to like deal with, you know? And so I think that it trained me to be able to withstand things going wrong and bounce back working harder instead of bouncing back depressed and unable to handle it. Um, and then I think also a lot of people don't think of ballets as storytelling. They look at it as, wow, how do they dance on point? How are they so flexible? How do they wear those corset tutus? But really, it's a story. Every ballet is a, usually comes from either a book or an old fairy tale. And so there's stories. And so you're telling a story on stage. And that is one of my favorite things about it. Because when you think about Nutcracker, for example, you think about the Tchaikovsky music and you think about, you know, dancing Nutcrackers and the Sugar Plum Fairy. But really, it's a little girl who goes into a dreamland and gets kind of lost in there. It's like, Christmas Alice in Wonderland, you know? And so I think that the storytelling aspect of it makes it, it translates really well to acting for me. I think that that body awareness that you have also makes it so, instead of it being my acting is here, my acting is here. Like I, it's, my body is another element of my acting, but especially doing a show like Miobi where it's like gymnastics and, you know, your movement is a whole other character then. Yeah. And it's certainly interesting to hear how a lot of people, I would assume, two unrelated, two completely unrelated things are actually similar uh, in its entirety. Because like you said, ballet, acting, it's all about storytelling. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of my dearest, oldest friends, Tori Trowbridge, um, is doing a show right now about being a dancer and I'm like the most excited for her because she is the most beautiful person inside and out, but she's a great dancer. And for both of us to have booked shows where we are using our dance is the coolest thing ever. It's the coolest thing ever that we both spent so many years painstakingly working at something and then we're successful in it in a completely different thing. Yeah. That is super awesome. I can't even imagine. So as far as mentality, before you would step on the stage for ballet, uh, before you would, you, you would go on screen, do you have a similar mentality? Anything that kind of gets you in that right state of mind, uh, getting you ready to tell those stories? Yeah, I think that for me, it's always been, to bring it all back around for you, I think it's always been a music connection for me. I think that I've always been able to, in different time periods of my life, find a song that gets me in the space or find a song that represents that character for me and kind of have always backdoored into characters and into like hyping myself up through music. And um, my dad is a drummer and so music has always been a huge part of my life and I blame him for playing the accordion. Um, but I think that the key for me has always been music to either center myself to hype myself up to get where i need to be ah, any favorite musicians who that's so big um i think right now i've been on a really big kick of an artist named bayonne his actual name is roger sellers but um, I won tickets on the radio before pre-pandemic i won tickets on the radio to go see uh Ra Ra Riot, and he was the opener for them, and I was so obsessed with it after that. Um, obviously, Bombay Bicycle Club is a big one for me. I love them. Um, my boyfriend's band, Weiss Fapes, I obviously like. I just did a song with him, so that'll be coming out. Um, uh, it's, I got to see the Rolling Stones again, which was cool. Yeah, and Kaleo opened. That was awesome. Um, I have a music problem. I kept winning tickets on the radio to the point where it was like, I can't go to all of these shows. I have a job. Like it got out of hand. Thank you, 88.5 for all the tickets. <laughs> you have good luck. I've never won a ticket from calling in in my life. 
I won like 15 in a row. How is this possible? I, I must have been the only person calling. My mom kind of like hurt my feelings because she was like, I guess you're the only one calling in. And I was like, <laughs> I thought I was lucky. <laughs> Whatever. I think once you exceed a certain amount of wins, then it, it really goes beyond luck. That's a skill at that point. That's something you should put on your resume. I am a professional ticket winner. That's a great job. That is a really great job. I started, because it's a public radio station, I started donating because I was like, at this point, I need to pay for all of my tickets. <laughs> yeah, see, I, I wish that there were like the, so I like all types of music, really, but I really like 50s to 80s mm -hmm. country music. I like 50s music like Sam Cooke, Otis Redding, but I love me some Conway Twitty. I love me some George Jones or Randy Travis. But, you know, yeah. there really aren't many, uh, especially now with COVID, but in general, yeah. many of those guys around anymore. So, no. for me, you know, if I win, I'm probably just going to give it to my twin, but she's the one who wins all the tickets. Well, I mean, I'm a huge, like, Patsy Cline fan, and there's a Patsy Cline impersonator in our area that is really fantastic. I, she's a fun one to go see. But there isn't – I mean, there is some good country music – because I'm in Los Angeles, there's some good country music, but it's not the same as, that's not what the Hollywood music scene is promoting, you know? And you can go see like Chris Stapleton if you want to do like that kind of a thing. But uh, what was the other one? Oh, check out Jamestown Revival. That's another one I won tickets to. And I, I really like them. I thought that they, they put on an amazing show. I almost thought the show was better than the album. <laughs> really? That, yeah. That's good. And, and I also won Wilder Woods was another good one where I was like, man, that's good live. And it was such a cool location because he was like on a porch and I just picked a seat without really knowing because it looked like a backyard. I picked the seat and then he was like right there. I was like, oh. <laughs> I feel like he's singing right to me. Yeah. yeah. I was just sitting there with my Jack Daniels like, hello. <laughs> And my sister and I, we were enormous fans. I'm sure this gets brought up, uh, brought up all the time of Make It or Break It. Now, that has been over a decade old now. Has that sunk in yet? No. <laughs> it will never sink in. It's ridiculous to me that that was that long ago. Um, I, it just seems like it was yesterday for us. And I can't believe like multiple of them have, are having babies or have babies. Like it's what adults <laughs> Cass and I are slacking apparently, but yeah, it's, it's such an honor to see how many people have connected with that. And I guess it was, it had a resurgence during the pandemic and people got to plug back into it. I've always been really honored at my character obviously went through some traumatic stuff. And um, I've always been really honored at the fact that people seem to really connect with that and people really connect with the underdog fighting back kind of spirit of pacing, which is definitely who I am as a person. And so that the fact that people like that so much has always just been so special for me. And it was such a special show. Holly Sorensen, our writer creator did just such a fantastic job making real characters out of what could be a very hokey, the gymnastics is crazy, you know? But to work on such a special show with so many amazing special people was great. It was such a, a life-changing experience for me. There are two things I wish for. First, that there'd be a second Roadhouse movie, uh, you know, because uh, again, I, I love the mullets and all that. And second, make or break, it needs to come back. You know, I, 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 I really hope that one day it will uh, in, some, in some capacity, but who knows? Well, okay, not just because you're on with me right now, but who do you think would have won the Olympics? Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't feel like, like I can answer that question. Who do you think would have won? <laughs> I think it would have been me, but that's obviously, who, who, what am I going to say? I think Lauren would have won. No, I think it would have been pacing. But it's one of those things that all of us girls, anytime we see each other, it's like, I would have won the Olympics, thanks, bye. Like, <laughs> it's a ridiculous thing. But yeah, I think it would have been pacing. She worked too hard to, I mean, all of them worked really hard. All of them have such interesting, different stories. That, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I cannot answer that question because if I interview any other ones, I don't want anyone to get angry with me. I'm sure you can understand. So the process of, of, of getting a role, especially a lead in that show, how did that come about? Um, 
you know, what's funny is I just kind of made the decision to not full-time dance anymore. Um, I had just had a major injury to my knee. And so I kind of made the choice of, I'm, I'm going to switch up what is my main focus. And I called my agent um, and said, if you hear of anything, just send me out on something. And she said, I actually have something in front of me that asked for people with dance experience and I think you'd be good for it. I was like, great, send it over. I got my audition. I went in the next day. I got my call back. I went in the next day. I went in and tested for Disney. It was in like a, a week time. My life completely went from, I have no idea what I'm going to do. Everything's ruined to, oh, cool. I just booked a series. <laughs> oh my goodness. It was the craziest week of my life. Also, I hadn't turned 18 yet. Whew. Yeah, I was, I was 17 and turned 18 right before we shot the pilot. Wow, that is yeah, incredible. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Wow. I actually that's love that That's reassuring for you in your <laughs> life. <laughs> I, I would feel like, again, you know, ballet is, is kind of, it, it, it makes you more versatile. It can kind of help with everything. I bet it would also be a little advantageous for you being in a gymnastics. I mean, did you find that to be pretty helpful? Yeah, it was hugely helpful. Um, it was it made my transition into doing stunts a lot easier. And Cass had a cheerleading background, dance background, and so did Josie. Josie had a tumbling background. And I think Chelsea Hobbs and Chelsea Tavares both had danced some. And so all of us had pretty easy transitions into, because most of the time we were just doing, you know, like it's, we were doing pretty minimal, but the, the last, big routine that I did, the last big floor routine I did, um, the shiny one where we shot it with the phantom camera and it's all slow mo -y. Um, that was probably the coolest one for me because I got to do so much of that, that they only had, I think it was Jen Hansen that did my stunts for that one, but, um, they only had her do actual like tumbling passes and they used all of my stuff for the rest of it. Wow. So that was like huge honor for me. And then also the other one that I loved doing a whole bunch was the tango routine that I did with Rigo, <laughs> with my friend Tom. That was one of my, like my two favorite dance highlights of the show for me. Gymnastics is super hard. Uh, when I was younger, I, I used to do gymnastics summer camp every single year. Uh, and I, you know, eventually mastered the uh, handstand without falling on my face. Uh, I've got a mean cartwheel, dude. <laughs> you got a big cartwheel, but but your legs straight while you're doing it, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. mine are not. My, mine are not at all. Uh, that the backflip is something I tried to do for years upon years. I eventually learned how to do the half backflip, and the half backflip is when you jump back and you fall square in the uh, top you, of your yeah, head, and your knees smack your face. Yes, I had about nine concussions over that span. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I good at doing those things in. off of a diving board still. Oh, hey, but you know, I I've got 30 year old knees now, so they don't wanna <laughs> they don't wanna do that anymore. They're not interested. I'm sure this just varied per per episode, but what did training like especially for like the floor routines, what did your training for for a gymnastics show look like? We had a couple of weeks leading up to it that we did three or four days a week usually of gearing up for it. And it was a lot of physical conditioning to be able to make it through those types of filming conditions. Because, you know, like anybody knows on a film set, it would take us seven working days to shoot one episode. So if you think about it, what would be a two minute floor routine is something you film all day. You have to be able to do that all day. So we would have several days of us just kind of like prepping stuff and getting used to, you know, we'd have to callous up our hands a little bit so we could handle the bars and things like that. And then they would bring in our stunties and we would learn routines together. So we would have a couple of set routines for ourselves. So like per season, we'd have one beam routine, one bar routine, one floor routine that we could, and one like vaulty thing and we would get those really solidly locked in. So it'd be like, okay, so the next part of my routine is this. Okay, that doesn't work great for camera. So, okay, the next part is this. We can transition into that better. And then you would just run it like that. 
And so your stunt team became your best friend. They had to be. Because, like, come on, girl, make me look good. Like, do those flippies. So it was fun. Um, Jordan Trickert was one of my stunties that I loved so much. And she just it was just so cool to see yourself do things like that. Because I'd be over at Video Village waiting for them to like do a pass of her doing stuff and she would just kill it. And I'd be so proud of me, <laughs> of her, of her. <laughs> but it was like having the circus on set every day because I mean, we had high level athletes just walking around. It was so cool. Yeah, that must have been such an uh, awesome experience. Now make your break, if it wasn't based on gymnastics, what other sport would you want it to be based on? Are there any other sports that would have piqued your interest? Well, I do have a favorite Olympic sport for that's, you know, not necessarily a glittery kind of a sport. It's not ice skating, you know. Um, I really like curling. Oh. I love curling. I think it's partially because I love to sweep and mop, and it's kind of the same. Um, but I love curling. It's so cool. It's like chess on ice. Also, I bowl a lot, and I would love it if bowling were a bigger part of the Olympics. Just saying. Hey, to be honest with you, I didn't even know bowling was an Olympic sport. It's not. I think oh, it gotcha. should be. Because right now it's a collegiate sport. Because I don't know if you know that, but it's like college bowling is kind of a thing. Um, but I would love to see bowling be a bigger part. A couple summers ago, uh, my friend and I, we went bowling a lot because we had nothing better to do. And I finally learned how to do the uh, curve with the bowling ball. I don't yeah, know what my score was. It was probably like, a, you know, it was really, really drastically low. But I got a couple strikes. Uh, and so if you're ever in St. Louis, and, you know, once we go back to sense of normalcy, I will school you in bowling. Oh, I would love that because I'm a league bowler. Okay, I will not school you in bowling, but we'll have fun. <laughs> <laughs> What's your second favorite Olympic sport other than gymnastics? Uh, I like boxing. Ooh, okay. I, 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 well, because big, smart arts and boxing are the two primary sports I cover. Yeah. Uh, I, I like all, I mean, I, I, I do like gymnastics. I've interviewed quite a few Olympic gymnasts. What other sports do I like? Uh, I, I appreciate all the, this kind of like the general answer, but I appreciate all the summer and winter Olympic sports just because I see the hard work that gets put into oh, it. There's yeah. something majestic about watching the, the top of the top. People have worked their whole lives to get to one stage, just do their thing. I mean, totally. I, I, I love swimming because I can't swim. Uh, I love biking because I can't bike. Uh, I like synchro diving. That's another cool one. That's, that is some hard stuff. It's crazy, isn't it? Because it, think about it. If someone misses by one second, it's kind of ruined. It's over. It's yeah. over. I can't imagine yeah. exactly. I, think it's, I, I find it so amazing that people do spend so much time in their lives working for one moment, really. Maybe they get a couple, couple Olympics out of it, but really it's for one moment and I think that all of the sports are so cool and so interesting when you get to hear a commentator who actually knows about it yeah I find that to be so impressive yeah it's what it's all about there have been a couple Olympians who I've talked to who have been in like four to four or five Olympic uh games like there was one who's a sprint canoeist uh and, and th that sport in itself is crazy like yeah motion sickness hello uh, I know <laughs> It's absolutely crazy. I mean, if, you know what? If I were to be an Olympian, I think I'd be an Olympian in ping pong. That's a sport that I really Ooh. like. What sport like would you be an Olympi pong. Olympian in besides the, uh, that one, whatever the one Curling. Is. Curling. Yeah. Would, you be, Curling. would you be an Olympic curler? Oh, absolutely. I actually still have aspirations of becoming an Olympic curler because it's not something that, like, youth is on your side. That is, like, an old band sport, and I'm about it. That's that one where I'm, I'm down for curling. And Hollywood Curling Club um, is definitely a place I would frequent more if it were not pandemic time. But, I mean, it's a million degrees here year-round. Go stand in an ice box. It's great. <laughs> oh my it's goodness. perfect for me. <laughs> so, so post make it or break it, uh, was there pressure on you being that you came from a starring role, uh, such a su successful show? Was there any pressure on you as an actor to kind of keep that going? I think that there is always some pressure. And, you know, the other thing is when I started, I was 18. And by the time we were done, I was 23. And so I wanted to, I wanted to transition into being more of an adult 
And unfortunately, I looked so young still that I kept playing high school. I mean, I just finally made it to college like last year, you know? Um, so I think that there is a level of pressure of expectation, but there's also a level of pressure of, oh, you're going to look exactly like you did that. And I, you know, I don't, but it's, it is a tough transition, no matter what I think coming off of a show, if you're not going straight to another show, but I booked a bunch of cool movies and did a bunch of movies right after it and just kept being forever 17. So I'm happy that I finally, I have a, I have two movies coming out soon and in both of them, I'm like an adult. That's cool for me. Do you prefer TV or movies? You know, I get that question kind of often and my answer is weird. Um, but I think I prefer TV for the sake of you get to live in a character for so long. Um, like I played Payson for five years and I think that that is so cool because you get to really live in that person during filming season. And I like that. I think that when I am doing movies, there's always an element of, I don't know, sadness that I don't get to spend more time as that person or play that character longer. Um, and maybe that's just because Make It or Break It was my first big booking. And so I got used to, hey, let's do this for five years. But, um, I don't know. I think I prefer TV. Could you imagine being like Johnny Depp who like literally lives in his character? Like that dude I'm sure hasn't showered in like two months. Oh, no, no thank you. Well, you know, it, when you get to that point, people around you are willing to put up with that. <laughs> are they though? They don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so I, I, I know obviously going across your, your, your website, which again has that great blog that you're into photography, uh, art, for, for the, this is a loaded question here. I know you've, you've still been following acting, but what has, for your fans, sum up the past decade since Make or Break It? What have you been up to? I mean, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I have been working as a photographer a lot, which I love. I love getting to shoot miniature stuff and human portraits and, you know, just kind of bounce all over the place. That works for me very well. Um, I have been doing, um, I shot a couple of movies since then, obviously. Um, and then I think that traveling and doing art has just been at the forefront for me. It's been a really fun journey. And I definitely did get into a kind of crazy workflow where I was going project to project to project to project. And I think that it's been nice to kind of take a break and taking a break is what made me want to start doing the website and doing the blog and doing this stuff. Um, mainly because I had a bunch of art that I was sitting on and just realized like, well, it's kind of selfish for me to just like, let me look at this picture. Cool. Like I, I just wanted to share it and more importantly, inspire other people to like share their photography back. I want to see stuff. Like, what are you looking at every day? So I think that it was more about just getting further into, further into being an artist and further into freeing up my mind and having a open URL to do that definitely hit the mark for me. Yeah, well, I think you're incredible. The best is yet to come. T tell me those near future goals uh, for the remainder of this crazy year in 2021. What do those goals look like for you? Well, I should probably start Christmas shopping. Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I have a new dog, obviously. And so my goal is to get her to at least two national parks because I went to like 10 national parks this year so far. And so now she needs to get out some more. So I want to make sure that she gets to go to cool places. Um, I want to, I'm trying really hard and it is tough to post something on my blog every two weeks because I know I put a lot into it so I can't just like pump them out really fast. Um, my next one that I want to write about is, and tell me if this is stupid, I think it's interesting, the science behind why we can't ask for help. I love it. Yeah, so that's my next one. Um, and then the other 
journey that I'm in the middle of is becoming a minimalist. I'm trying to live with less and to live completely eco-neutral. Um, so that's kind of hard, especially with Christmas coming up. Do you know how much research you have to do about every item before you can buy it for somebody? It takes forever. But those are my three things is getting my dog to parks, getting my blog more consistent, um, and continuing my minimalist journey. Let's do it. I'm going to leave the floor to you. Anyone you'd like to thank? How can people find your blog? How can people find you on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, all that good stuff? Okay. So my Instagram is my first name, A-Y-L-A-K, my last initial. Um, my blog is literally just alakel.com. It's super easy. Um, my... I guess that's all of my handles, but the people I'd like to thank are mom. I love you so much. Um, dad, thanks for being awesome. Jesse, I love you. You're amazing. Um, Ocho, if you're watching this, it's past your bedtime. No, I'm just kidding. I'm getting out of control here. Um, but yeah, it's, if anybody wants to reach out and connect with me, please talk to me. I want to know what's going on with everybody. And I try my absolute best to respond to everyone. And it, it takes me a while, but I will get there.